All right, so we're jumping into the listing agreement, exclusive right to sell. So this is form 220, right? And again, if you've been through this before, it's always good to hear it again because we are starting to see some things pop up, like I said, um, from a liability standpoint, compliance issue, those sorts of things. So we'll make sure we kind of cover them as we go through them. So what that will mean is we'll go through quickly some cer uh, certain parts of it that I don't see as much of an issue right now, but that does not mean it's any less important. I just want to make sure that we do these differently each time so they stay relevant and fresh. So, um, so jumping through, the first part of the listing agreement simply talks about basically the parties to the transaction. Um, basically, here you're going to put the sole owners of the property and Keller Williams Realty. Um, you can specify what specific office you are in. Um, it's not as important. However, it, it definitely would be better to have Keller Williams Realty, West Ashley, Keller Williams Realty, Mount Pleasant, Islands, Key. Chucktown, which, whichever one you are. So make sure you put that in there. As far as having the owners that are on there, you know, it's probably a good idea to look up the deed. Um, you can always ask them for a copy if they have one. Uh, if you don't, if they don't have one, it's an easy thing to look up. And quite honestly, I'm actually going to put a quick broker minute video on my broker minute list here on how to go look up the deed to a property. Um, because that, that will be very helpful and it helps you make sure that they understand, um, to look at that they understand what's on the deed to make sure that they agree to it. We are seeing a lot of situations recently where it's popping up at the last minute um, where you know the property may have been what's an example. We had one where a property was inherited by a handful of siblings. Uh, one of the siblings didn't want anything to do it. They quick claim deemed it over to the to the estate. The other sim, uh, siblings wasn't really discovered until closing that that wasn't done properly right was not uh, was not known to the sellers they would have the siblings would have had no idea uh, what that looked like um, it was not something that they intentionally withheld however it did cause some issues towards the end and technically what happens with that is you now have an unmarketable what they call an unmarketable title um, so that does put them in default of the contract so you want to make sure that they are able to actually market and sell the title. I'm actually going to jump onto the contract now, realizing I did not have it up as I was walking through it. Uh, so that's, you know, this for the first part is what you want to make sure you have in there, the complete ownership on there. And then in addition to that, Keller Williams Realty. Now, of course, you could look at the tax records, everything there, it's just not going to be as accurate. All right. So the first thing that's really coming up, this really applies to the new MLS rules is for the time frame and the terms of the listing agreement. We've got some clarity on this. Uh, it's not necessarily fantastic news. It's not really bad news. It's just news. We need to be able to, to adjust to it. So um, with the new rules in the MLS, what the rule is stating is you have from seven days at the start of a valid listing agreement that you have to put the listing into the MLS. Okay. So for round purposes, we're going to say August 1. So if you sign this, you have a listing agreement here. It says from time period beginning on August 1 and ending at the you know, midnight on December 31st. Um, this is what the listing period is. So a couple things on here. If you write that, you sign it, you've got seven days from, from August 1 that has to go into the MLS. At that point, it can go into, this all starts August 18th, by the way. At that point, it can go into what will be the new optional coming soon status. That gives you another seven days where you can then market the property, but not have showings. And you've technically gone, you're, you're compliant with the clear cooperation and everything there. A couple things to keep in mind. In that first seven days from August, again, for these round numbers, August 1 to August 8, it's still the same rules apply from public marketing. You can't publicly market the property. The moment that it does become publicly marketed, which basically means put out to buyers or basically put out to anyone who's not exclusively represented by you or Keller Williams. Right. That's kind of what it's, it's basically with the broker's exclusive. The public would be outside of uh, into the general public. Once you do that, you have one business day that you then have to put it into the MLS. So that first seven day rule goes away. You now have trumped it with publicly marketing. You still have seven days that you can use that you can use in the coming soon status to obviously publicly market at that point and withhold showings. OK, something to keep in mind. Now, one of the workarounds that a lot of people like to do, and this is something that I was a proponent of as well, because we all know that in a lot of situations, particularly if you're, you're looking at properties that are needing to be uh, prepped to, for work, things to get done, photography. I mean, in this market, sometimes it may be hard to get photographers out there within that period of time. You may need more than seven days. So what we'll do is we'll put in a later date in here. Let's just say, for instance, 
Um, you've got a seller who's their second home, right? You met with them. They want to list their home, but they're not going to be able to come back to the end of the month to do everything. So really, they're not going to go into the MLS until September. Well, if you sign that today, you have you no longer have the unlimited rule. Or you can wait to put it in there. So what you do is you say, okay, valid, you, your listing agreement does not start until September 1. So you've got the listing agreement. However, you don't have the seven days trigger until September 1. So that is a workaround for that. Now, here's the thing. Here's where we're at risk. That is not a valid listing agreement until September 1. So if that person runs across another agent that says, hey, tell me about what you're doing with your house. And they're like, well, I'm looking at selling it, but I've got a listing agreement that starts September 1. That age, they're fair game for that agent to say, well, here's why I'm better. Right? Of course, they wouldn't say it that way. But let's say they said something that made them say, well, you know what? This agent does sound like they're better than the other one. And they decide to go with them versus you. They've technically not done anything wrong. You weren't protected by the listing agreement because it doesn't start till September 1. So there's the risk in waiting for a post-dated listing agreement. Um, as a side note, no promises as to when. What we are looking at doing to help as a workaround in, those, in that situation is having some sort of internal agreement that we have drafted up from the attorney, which is basically like a marketing reimbursement agreement. Because you, we market properties very well. We go above and beyond. That takes time, effort, and money. So if during now, between now and September 1, if they find another agent that for whatever reason they decide to go with or, over you, you may be out money, you may be out time. So we can have some sort of marketing agreement that could possibly say in the event this does happen or a certain amount or whatever it may be. Um, again, that's kind of 2.0. We don't have that yet. Uh, however, it's, it's sitting on the test to take a look at. So bottom line is, yes, you can quote unquote get around the seven days by putting a later listing date. Just know you're not protecting yourselves from other agents during that. You're not insulated just from having an, a, a listing agreement. Um, at the end of the day, keep in mind, if that's happening, you can't do any marketing at that point. You can't do um, internal marketing. You can't do public marketing because you don't have a listing agreement. So should you decide to do some marketing at that point, there's some licensing law issues um, that we triggered that we'd have to deal with. So, all right, clear as mud. I have a question. Okay. Um, in the past, I used to leave the dates blank right. and then have them sign the listing agreement. And then when they were ready to go, I would put in the start date and end date. And I guess that's not right either. Yeah, same thing would apply, except in a different way. So with that, technically, you don't have a valid contract because you don't have the final terms. And terms do have a start and it would include at any time. So if you don't have that in there, you really don't have a valid agreement. Um, you know, here's the deal, Gene. It, it's a good, it brings up a good discussion overall. I mean, it, honestly, having the start time and end time would protect you here's how I look at it. And this may be naive and, and people are pushing back that it may be a little naive. If I'm listening, if Tyler says, Hey, I'm gonna list my house with you. And I'm like, okay, cool. And we sign from September one to December 31st. I feel like I'm a much more protected than just by saying, Hey, we'll wait and sign the paperwork on September one. doesn't mean he can't go out and work with another agent, but quite frankly, if you set it up in a sense where he then goes, goes and finds another agent, decides that he's not really going to honor this agreement that starts in September and work with someone else. I mean, in my opinion, there's probably a red flag there anyway. Um, again, that's where we tend to, I tend to maybe morph in my naivete with contract law. Because anytime I bring that to the MLS, the South Carolina you know, Association's attorneys all in, they're like, I think you're naive to think that, you know, you're going to change the seller's loyalty to make it more to you if they find out they actually don't have a valid agreement until September 1. Um, so that's why we're working on maybe some additional paperwork to have. Um, all right. So you have a raised hand. Do you have a question? Sorry. Do you have owner written on there? So it says owner written hand, raised hand. You're muted. Hold on one second. You are muted. Yeah. If they yourself. were to, you know, go with, 
in there that lag time, go with another somebody to work with, they would be in the same situation. So it seems to me, it, would, it isn't it a good idea to kind of explain the whole land and the lay of the land to the client from the beginning so they understand this is just the way the laws are written. You know, we're going to do 100% for you. Yeah. 100, yes. I mean, that's that would be the way to explain it because you're right. If the next person says, you know, they're saying, well, we're not going to go to September 1 either. They really don't have an agreement. The question then then asks what happens if they sign an agreement now that goes through September 1 when they have an agreement saying they're going to start a listing with you September 1. You can't have an exclusive right to sell agreement with two people. Um, so there really then becomes a conflict, which again, this is where we go into that whole discussion, similar to we do in the uh, in the purchase and sale agreement, where it's not as important to find out who wins the battle as much as how do we, what, man, um, Chris Grace with Butler College, he, he's, the, he's a fantastic attorney at Butler College, he's, where I'm going to have him do some interviews with some different topics. Uh, he put it great. He said, you know, while a lot of people are arguing point, we really need to be problem solving, right? And, and I was like that. And what he means by that, or principle, not point, he says, you know, the principle of it is I've got a contract. So the principle of this, you can't have two contracts. The point is, he's like, that's nice and all. And you might be right. And should you go to court, you might win. And maybe we look at problem solving to figure out how we do it. So in this case, how do we pre-problem solve, which I think the point that you just made is, is exactly right. Explain this to the seller, the intention of me doing this because you need time. You need a time to put it on there. I need time to get the marketing done. So you know, here's why we're post dating it. Just understand you've got to you've got to decide as a business owner if you're comfortable keeping a post dated listing agreement open in the event that they may get quote unquote poached. And I hate to use the word poached because I don't want you what to set you up for failure that you have a dog in that fight because they're technically not being poached. Um, right. So good questions. All right, let's jump back on. Second part. And we're going to review that time frame again when we get down when we get down to the um, types of agency or the MLS side of it. So again, full description of the property you want to have here. Um, you know, one thing you want to keep in mind is tax map numbers matching addresses. I know some we're starting to see a lot of land come on the market, and so if you have some assemblage or yeah uh, assemblage properties where you have multiple pieces of property that are being sold together, you know, we just had one with an agent had five different properties that actually sold as one. So they actually had six total listings. They had the five individual properties and then they had one listing that was all of them assembled. They were willing to sell it either way. You know, for that, you technically do need the six different listing agreements, right? You'd have a, a listing agreement for each one of the tax map IDs and then you would have one listing agreement for all five of the tax map IDs together. Um, you can't make up a new one and you could you would just make a note on there as assemblage. Uh, if that happens, you wanna make sure um, that you, you engage the seller's attorney early on. Say, hey, here's what we're doing. We're putting together a possible assemblage. Can you go ahead, start running titles, start pulling all the information on these. So you don't run into a situation where for whatever reason, you may have a lien on one of the properties or some sort of clout in the title on one of the properties, but not the other four because of time, of, you know, decades of whatever on there. So just wanna make sure you keep that in mind. Uh, as always, the more information you can put in this section, the better. If you don't have the information, dash it out. Joseph, I have a question. For whatever reason it can't be filled in. Um, go ahead. Um, I've got a potential client who has a 34 acre piece of property that he has subdivided. So it has right. five separate TMS numbers, but he's selling it. There's one owner and he's selling it all together. Does that go on one listing agreement? If he only wants to sell them all together, then yes. Okay. And you would all have right. them, you'd have like a master listing agreement with all the tax map, map numbers on there. Now, uh, same thing applies. I would definitely make sure you engage the attorney that did the subdivision of it um, to see the best way to market it, make sure they can be marketed. It was properly subdivided. Then, you know, in that case, and, and I would I tread lightly on how much involvement you have on gathering that information without their help. Because what you don't want to do is run into a situation where you're marketing a property that's already been subdivided. Uh, and then in the process, in the due diligence process, they find out that there was some incomplete work done. And now you've got, you know, false advertising or something like that. Not that it's false, but it just may not be the correct information. Um, all right. So jumping back on. Good question, by the way. 
All right, so consenting to dual designated agency, I'm not gonna spend a ton, ton of time on that. We did cover that basically a lot in last week's um, contracts class, but again, just a couple notes to remember, you're, they've already supposed to have seen the disclosure agreement at the, or uh, disclosure statement at this point. So make sure that you're not popping it on them right here where it says that they've already been given this. Uh, and then obviously they either will consider it or will not consider it. I did that backwards. They will consider it or will not consider it. Um, understand that at any given time, it can be, you know, they don't have to commit up front that they're considering it. You know, so if you're taking a listing and someone says, yeah, I'd probably be fine with it. But, you know, if this dyer was somebody you knew or your, you know, your brother was buying real estate, I don't know that I'd consider it in that situation. That would be, a, a, in my opinion, a valid reason for them not to be super comfortable with balanced representation and dual agency. Um, we jump to terms. Terms are as follows. This is where we put our price in here. Again, if you have a listing agreement, you haven't determined the price yet. You put TBD in here. You do not have a valid listing agreement. A lot of times this will happen if you've got the, let's go back to the situation of September 1. Um, you know, a lot could happen between now and then. Depends on how much work they get done. You know, it could be at, you know, 875. It could be at 900. I don't know yet. Well, you got to put something in there in order for it to be a technically valid listing agreement. Uh, so be careful you're not leaving anything blank on there just because you don't know yet and then assuming that you have a listing agreement in place particularly now that we kind of have that seven day window of having the valid listing agreement and actually putting it to um into the MLS. um we do talk about our total brokerage fee here which is the total commission 90 percent of the time and just well, how much you are paying out to the cooperating agents if any on page two um Brokerages, there should be no variation or exception in the amount of fee or commission to be paid unless specified under paragraph 28. What this says is that you're taking a listing and it says it's 6%. I'm going to offer out three. There is no ex, um, variation or exception in the amount of the commission unless I specify that differently. So if I have, you know, an unrepresented buyer come in or if I double side the sale, my commission is not changed unless we agree on it separately, at which point it would be variable rate commission. So you just want to make sure you spell this out to them. Again, you might want to word it a little differently. This isn't a super sexy way to put it. You know, so if you're talking to your seller, you might want to simply word this differently to say what this means is we've already agreed to this. It doesn't the amount doesn't change or vary depending on any circumstances. Right. So, if, you know, this is paid regardless of agents that are involved. Um, Couple points on this: It does defer commission until the closing date. However, it does say that the uh, commission is earned when you have the property under contract. Okay, again, that's really more for your situational awareness. Just understand that it's you know this. The reason we say that is if the seller defaults on this at the last minute or breaches contract, they could be responsible for their commission. I don't know if that's going to be part of your selling value and your listing presentation. <laughs> However, it is something for you to just keep in mind of. There is a protection period. Um, the protection period says that if within 30 days, which is typically what's put in here, um, to, uh, if it sells to a buyer to whom the property was shown by the owner broker, another broker, or any other person or firm during the term of this agreement, full fee shall be payable by the owner. The protection fee shall be terminated. The owner enters into a listing agreement with another broker during the protection period. So a couple of things to keep in mind in this. One, it only applies to buyers that actually looked at the property while it was listed with you. This does not mean if someone new comes along that did not take a look at the property, right? But if the buyer, but that buyer looked at it either through you, through another broker, um, whatever it may be, then that's who it would pertain to. Now, the reason I kind of pull the screen back up to, to clarify the broker thing is let's say you do have a situation where you have a Keller Williams listing that for whatever reason you expired with Drew and they do decide to switch to a different agent. I'm not encouraging going out and soliciting to Keller Williams expired agent or listings or anything like that. I'm just saying, let's say something happens and they decide they, their listing ex, you know, expires with one and then Jennifer and knows that person. Jennifer says, hey, I'm going to relist. Um, this That does not terminate the technically does not terminate the protection period. So if you happen to be taking that listing and you know that it was held by a Keller Williams listing prior to this or within the last 30 days, reach out to me so we can make sure we properly handle that. Uh, nine times out of 10, it's not an issue, but you don't want your seller to be responsible for paying two agents. Now, at the end of the day, it does solely come down to the broker and I'm not gonna hold that seller to paying two commissions. 
However, I want to make sure I properly communicate with the original listing agent. Okay. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's jump back on the beginning of page two. Aren't listings fun? Aren't contracts fun? Why is everybody smiling? Mm -hmm. Jean had to turn her camera off. She's smiling so much. She loves she loves contracts so much. She's, she's, she knew we wouldn't be able to take it. All right, so the second part of this, for the purpose of this agreement, this sale shall be determined as a trans transfer of legal, equitable, and beneficial interest in the property. For money or exchange of the property and shall include, but not be limited to any transfer of the ownership interest in any corporation, limited liability, partnership, or entity, right? So again, it transfers ownership. Um, competition to, compensation, excuse me, to other brokers. This is basically where you're gonna map out what you're paying out of the commission from each one. Sub agency is not, I don't, they, this is just a clerical error. It should not be in here. Sub agency is not an actual valid representation in South Carolina. So the this one here would basically be in A. Uh, buyer agency and transaction brokerage, which is non-agency, which by the way means any buyer that is not represented by an agent, right? So whether or not, um, you know, they can work with an agent from a transaction broker standpoint, or if they don't have an agent that's working as a transaction broker, you then by default become the transaction broker, okay? It's basically the non-agency relationship that happens in South Carolina. The reason I get so meticulous on this is, you know, it states in here that you're going to pay them a percentage. So if you're not the transact, or if there's not another agent that's the transaction bro broker, you're the other agent, right? You're the transaction broker. This does not mean it's dual agency. This is super important to understand because this is uh, one, it doesn't necessarily need to be dual agency. And quite frankly, I don't think it should be dual agency if you have no relationship with the buyer. Buyer comes in on a sign call, says, hey, I wanna write an offer on this. Fantastic, sit down with them, explain agency with them, find out if they wanna be represented. If they do not, great, you're gonna represent them as a client or a customer, not a client. Does not change the compensation, okay? So just wanna make sure that you understand that. Now, if they come in and they have a buyer and for, or a buyer agent, and for whatever reason, that buyer agent is offering them transaction brokerage level service versus agency level of service, that's not our field to die on, right? I mean, as a transaction broker, regardless, I personally, if I were still fairly active as a listing agent, I would not offer any different between a buyer agent and a transaction bro broker as it relates to what I'm paying out. There's no risk mitigation by having them represented by someone and there's no and, uh, increase in risk by having them as a transaction broker if there's another agent involved. So and I point that out because it, when this was first released and we're still seeing some residual um, effects on it, it when transaction brokers first came out, People were offering zero because they want to make sure they had a representation to a buyer, an agent before they paid them. I, I don't specifically, I don't see the point of that. You could choose to run your business however you like. I would not, I don't think it's an, a, a great idea to encourage as many people as possible to sell your house by offering more to a transact or more to an agent, buyer's agent than a transaction broker. That's just my Can an thing. attorney claim to be the transaction broker and collect that 3%? Whatever mm, it is. Good question. Um, if they are licensed, we can pay them, I think is the answer. I have to get back to you on that one. I mean, sort of um, a commercial now, question because, you know, I've my right. last two transactions, I ended up being the transaction broker and collected both sides, but in right. commercial, half these people don't have agents, they just have lawyers. Yeah, I mean, typically the lawyers are paid differently. The, the, the lawyers are paid hourly out of what they're doing. So right, and the client wouldn't want to pay them also an agency fee. Well, then that would be an expectations discussion with the client um, because they're from a from a commercial standpoint, they're going to have uh, attorney's fees regardless of commissions um, from an agent. Right. So I'd make sure they understand that it's not an if then um, it's an and. Um, now, that would also depend on the level of service they're getting from the agent as well as the level of service they're getting from the client or excuse me, the attorney. But typically those are very separate from each other. So it would be. You know, an attorney, well, well, two things. One, without, if it's not in the MLS, you don't have an obligation to pay anybody without a compensation agreement. So, you know, if now if you get a compensation agreement and you say, hey, yes, we're going to pay, you know, let's say you're the listing side, you're going to pay the transaction broker. Um, quite frankly, most of the, the um, attorney work that is done is going to be on the buyer side and that will be the buyer's responsibility. Right. And, it, you know, and, it, and that's, and that could be in addition to that buyer's aid, that, that commercial um, buyer's agent also being paid. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. And, and West Ashley were negotiating the um, 
uh, possibly new space, right? And we're self-representing in that. So what we're, you know, the commission that's being paid is separate. Um, you know, we may be paid that, but as the client, we're having to write a check for our attorney to review everything from a legal standpoint. So at the end of the day, you can't, you know, you, you can't practice law. So there would be two different fees that will be incurred by the clients on there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, jumping back in, earnest money. Again, this <laughs> basically, this is one of the many times that we just get, try to get ahead of earnest money, right? Earnest money owner authorizes a designated escrow agent as designated by the sales agreement to accept and hold on behalf of the owner, earnest money or escrow deposit made in accordance with the terms of any agreement to buy or sell real estate for the property. In the event of default or forfeiture by a prospective buyer, owner will reimburse escrow agent any costs incurred by escrow agent, including attorney's fees as a result of the release of payment to the owner of any of the earnest money deposited and such reimbursement may be made by broker from the earnest money deposit. All earnest money will be deposited in escrow's accounts. Basically what this says is there are fees that can go into it should the escrow agent want to charge the fees. This is the bold one you wanna make sure they understand. Owner understands that under all circumstances, including default broker will not, and this also means escrow agent, okay? You can just cross it out, but earnest money will not be dispersed to either party until both parties have executed an agreement authorizing the disbursement or until a court of competent jurisdiction has dis directed the disbursement. Okay, so again, this, is, uh, this needs to be made very, very clear. Earnest money goes nowhere without either a, a court order or written approval by, uh, signed off approval by both buyer and seller. I uh, just recently had this conversation earlier today from an agent that says, well, you know, the buyers are worried that the earnest money is no longer there. That's not possible. It isn't, or the seller's worried. It doesn't matter. It's not possible. The earnest money is protected by the state. So the clients need to understand that this is a state regulated. This is why I'm so grateful that we decided a few years ago to not hold earnest money anymore. It's like, it's like a completely separate job um, accounting for and liability wise for earnest money. Uh, it is state regulated. It cannot be released until what is said here. Even if it's completely obvious that the buyer breached or the seller's breaching, at the end of the day, it's, it's not punitive. Earnest money is not designed to be a punitive damage. So it's not just released or liquidated based on the default. Okay. Um, all right. Jumping back in. Signs. Owner grants the buyer broker permission to, to display signs under contract, sales pending or similar. Um, this goes through the broker's duties. Broker agrees to employ the best efforts, secure a contract to sale, or describe the property in such terms. Buyer broker's efforts shall include the direct efforts of broker's organization to bring about the sale, advertising the described property as broker seems advisable. And those advertising media and merit customer customarily used in the area. Furnace such additional information as necessary to cooperate real estate brokers um, and finding a buyer. You're contractually obligated. What this, what this says to me is you have a contractual obligation to update your clients on a regular basis. I know that seems foreign right now to have actually a long period of time where you have to update your client. Days on market are creeping back up. We are probably getting back to a time where it does take a little bit more than three and a half minutes for a property to sell. So this, you just want to keep in mind that the contract states is you, you're con contractually obligated to keep the, the owner informed of the process. Owner understands that the broker makes no representation or guarantees as to the sale of the property. You might want to reference this should you have a property for a se seller that wants you to list it for more than where you feel should, is necessary. Upon the termination or completion of this agreement, the broker shall keep confidential information about the property's confidential. Um... Sorry, I want to just read through this one again. Broker's limited liability or liability limitation. Basically what, what this says is owner agrees broker provided owner with the benefits, services and value in bringing a contract or a sale to the, or a contract to the property. Um, this also talks about what we're not be liable for. So fees in that broker is not liable to the owner in the amount of exceeding the broker's compensation. So if something does go south, right? And the seller gets sued or everyone gets sued that the, the broker is not going to be liable. The seller, the seller can't come after us for any more than what our compensation would have been. Should we do something regarding omission, messing up those sorts of things. 
Um, it also says here that the owner will identify and hold harmless and pay our fees for the broker from breach of contract um, and <laughs> for any negligent or intentional acts of omissions by parties, inspectors, professionals, service providers, contractors, including um, or introduced or recommended by the broker. The reason I point this one out is basically what this is saying, if you're going to zoom back out, is this is saying, should anything go wrong because it's something that was omitted or done poorly by someone you recommended, that the broker won't hold you liable for that. Some people also translate this, that should something go wrong because of something that you did or I did as the broker. And some sellers will push back on that and not want to sign it. Uh, if that's the case, reach out to me on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, typically, it's not the hill that we're going to die on. Um, most of these disclaimers and hold harmless um, disclaimers don't really hold up in court anyway. So it may not be worth your ban bandwidth to push back should a seller say, well, no, I'm, I'm going to want to be able to hold you liable. Now, when they say that, might want to go ahead and make a little note back in your mind to possibly keep your eye out on this person because they may be fairly trigger happy in litigation um, and, and always quick to be pointing fingers. So just something to keep in mind. Um, all right, paragraph eight, the owner's duties. This basically says, hey, by signing this agreement, here are the responsibilities you're taking on as a seller. You're gonna give me uh, information that's correct containing the concerning the ownership and the operation of the property and any encumbrances and liens affecting the property. This is a great trigger to say, are there anything? Are there any liens um, that are attached to this property that would not have shown up maybe in the tax record, something like that, which would include, but be not limited to solar panels, which you could possibly see financing of any uh, systems that they have in there. Um, this We've seen this lately with, with HVAC systems. People got a brand new HVAC system and they fin financed it and the early payoff is more than they can afford or than they want to afford. Um, so these are all things that come up as encumbrances or liens. You just want to make sure that you, you maybe use this part of the contract um, to say, hey, what's going on? Um, make sure they keep you abreast of any inquiries on the property. Permit the inspection and showing of the property by broker or broker's agents and by agents, subagents, or proactive <clears throat> prospective buyers is deemed reasonably necessary by the broker and to cooperate in the scheduling and carrying out of such showings and inspections as is necessary. You know, this is something to keep in mind. Um, we've recently seen this. I, I haven't even really thought about it until we read in this part of the paragraph. You know, this may be a good time to say, and one of the things that may happen is there may be follow-up inspections. There may be additional appraisals. There may be things that the buyer wants to do. I would encourage you to allow the buyer to do all of those. I'll make sure you're protected by the ones that are relevant to the contract. But if the buyer wants to come and inspect the property and it's not too much of a burden for you, or they want to come back and do another walkthrough or do something like that, I don't know that I'd push back on it. I don't know that that would be worth the red flag that it may send to the buyer. For example, we have recently, uh, we represent the seller. The buyer has decided they want to have another lender run the numbers and possibly do the financing versus the lender they originally decided. They have not made a decision to switch lenders. Okay. The seller is super nervous um, about it. They don't want to let them do the second appraisal. They don't see any need to do it. They already have the first appraisal. I don't know what the pushback is, to be honest with you. Um, the, they're protected by the contract. If the second appraisal comes in lower, they don't have to lower the price. Um, they can go with the first appraisal as an argument, so they'd be safe there. The, the contract does allow for the buyer to change lenders. So the buyer's not doing it day, which obviously the, the seller does not have to agree to. And if the seller says no, then the buyer has to stick with the first lender, right? So they're protected in all these areas. I say this not to call that specific topic out, just to say, I don't know that it's worth the bandwidth now to say no on any further inspections or anything just because of the limiting belief that you may have. You don't want to throw the buyer into a tailspin that you're hiding something or anything like that. Um, same thing applies to second opinions or, you know, they want to send an inspector out to see how the work was being done. Um, they don't have to let them, but the contract does say, and this does say in here that they will allow reasonable inspect, reasonably necessary inspections. Um, we had one seller that absolutely refused to let a buyer come to the house a couple of weeks before closing simply to measure so that they could start pricing out paint and carpet and everything. I don't know that that, I mean, again, maybe encourage your sellers up front to say this may be something they'd ask for. It's not abnormal. Obviously, if you work from home, if you have children, young children that are sleeping, stuff like that, we'll do everything we can to schedule around them. Hard and fast, no on a lot of these to me is, is a not something I would really encourage sellers to get in the habit of. 
All right, jumping back in. Um, obviously, we're going to offer it for sale. Um, this doesn't really apply, but we're talking about um, incur owner reasonable expenses for repairs, inspections, utilities, maintenance um, to be reimbursed as a separate expense. This typically doesn't happen unless you're doing listings for institutions. If you've got a corporate investor or if you've got if you do any bank work, a lot of times they may want you to um, take on the, the burden of putting it in utilities, et cetera turning on the utilities and everything in your name, et cetera. Should you get one of those, come to me. Let's set up time to chat. Um, there's some, there, it's, it's doable. We just want to make sure we set you up for, to protect yourself from any liability in that. Um, going to allow the closing attorney to pay the compensation. Um, we're going to publish the sales data in the MLS. We're going to take photographs and it's going to stay on the internet. We cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. Um, convey marketable title, uh, which we talked about earlier. Um, to allow the attorneys to furnish the brokers with copies of their settlement statement. Again, these all came up because of situations where sellers got mad. And so just so you know, Mr. Seller, that the attorney is going to set out, sell that, send off the settlement statement to me. So I will see all those numbers. Just don't be alarmed on there, but obviously I have to keep it confidential as well. Don't deal directly with prospective buyers, authorize the broker to um, divulge the existence of existing offers on the property, and then the furnish with us written instructions regarding any confidentiality that you have. Okay. Um, all right, property disclosure. Basically what this says is, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you've got a property disclosure statement you need to fill out. You have to be honest in it. You have to fill it out. There is no, there are very few times. The only time an exemption would come across, guys, is if they were, if they received the property via the courts. I still would encourage them to fill it out, even if it's no representation on what they know about each one. The reason is, is the property disclosure does act as a line of defense for the agents and the broker as a liability. Say, listen, you know, this is what the property owner has said. This is what they, you know, had this in here. I would have no reason to feel differently. Uh, it should something come out of this where they do misrepresent the condition of the property, um, then they will obviously hold harmless the broker on that because they were given the opportunity to divulge all that information. Do they need um, to do this if it's being sold as is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the condition or what they, what they want to do or anything like that, that doesn't change um, what they need to disclose on the property. Um, this basically goes through disclosure owner authorizes the broker to disclose the information about the property which basically says once you fill this out i can let people know this also lets them know that you you have permission to disclose it and should something come up you have an obligation to disclose it so you know they disclose everything in there they don't know about a leaking roof deal falls through they don't want to put the leaking roof back in the, in the property disclosure. They don't want to change it. They just want the buyer's agent, the buyer's inspector to find it. You're obligated to disclose it as a material fact. So just make sure that the, this is an area where you're protected in that. Um, taxes basically says that they will comply with the taxes regarding uh, withholding if they're out of state taxes. Any rollback taxes will be, will be taken out of closing. Um, any property taxes, any taxes that are due or owed by the seller, they agree to pay off in order to sell the property. Really kind of a redundant phrase because they talked about this earlier with any liens on their property. Um, Coastal Tidelands and Wetlands Act, in the event the property is affected by the provisions of this, they agree to um, go through, attach the addendum and, and participate in any way they need to on that. We're actually going to do a broker minute on that one as well. Just to kind of give a quick update of what that looks like, what you need to be on the lookout for. Um, let me jot it down before I forget. Coastal. Okay. Um, all right, 13. This basically goes through the two options. We've really covered most of this in the first part. These are the two options they have as far, regarding the multiple listing service. Now, this is going to be something we have to keep in mind here. This is a statewide document. So some things we have to keep you know, in mind of this is the property shall be entered in the MLS, um, of which the broker is a member within the time frame stipulated by their bylaws, rules, and regulations. Keep in mind, if you are a member of multiple MLSs, you may have the bylaws of one MLS that's separate from the bylaws of another. So you just need to keep that in mind. Um, owner agrees the broker may compensate an agent representing this. The owner agrees or does not agree the listing will be priced in electronic means, not limited to the internet, MLS data, et cetera, et cetera. A bro broker and owner agree to abide by the rules and regulations of the multiple listing service on which the property is listed. 
Okay. We've gone over those rules. Basically just says, if you sign your listing agreement from the date of the, the start of the listing agreement, you have seven days to get into the MLS. In the event, <clears throat> excuse me, in the event you publicly market it, you will trigger the clear cooperation um, from NAR, which means you'll have to go into the MLS within one business day. The way you could get around that is you do have you do not have to put the market the, the property in the MLS. It can be what we call in the brokerage exclusive. A brokerage exclusive will prevent the seller and broker from conducting any public marketing, which includes and not limited to site signage, social media, communication written or oral, yada yada yada. <clears throat> Basically, they we can tell the broke this we can tell currently active buyers that are under buyer agency agreement with Keller Williams about this listing and no one else. There is a separate paperwork that does need to be signed and filled out if you go with option two that does need to be submitted to the MLS. Okay, so if you did want to have a period of time where you did want to tell people within Keller Williams about it and not publicly market it, then you would have to do it as a, as a brokerage exclusive and you have to have that additional form filled out. Then should you decide to move and put it on MLS later, then you would just reselect option one from that standpoint. All right, lockbox, owner agrees to put a lockbox on the property, discloses everything you need to know about a lockbox. Basically, don't, um, don't, worry, don't leave things laying out, right? You do need a lockbox addendum should you have an owner, a non-owner occupied property. So if you have tenants that occupy the property, you would wanna get the tenants to sign a lockbox addendum. Sorry, it's about 4,000 degrees in my office right now. Um, you have them sign that lockbox addendum, which kind of, which basically states the same thing. Should you have a challenge with a tenant signing that, then you would want to reach out to the to the homeowner at that point and say, "Hey, they're not willing to sign this. Um, there is a, you know, there's a liability issue. You may want to take on. You you will be taking on if they don't sign it. Reach out to me, and we'll cross that bridge when you get to it." Um, <clears throat> let's see what else in here. <laughs> If other offers come in after you ratified, it's still my responsibility to present those offers to you. Um, the broker shall not continue marketing the property after the offer is accepted unless requested in writing by the owner to do so, which typically most owners want you to do, but understand that does not, that does not um, prevent you from following the MLS rules. If you have a contract on the property, it does have to be marketed as active, contingent, or pending. Commission rates and fees are negotiable. You agree to maintain the property once you have it under contract in the same working condition minus normal wear and tear. That includes your lawn, shrubbery, grounds to the, from the day of execution of the contract till closing. So a good time to remind them to say, hey, we want to make sure that we, um, you, can, you maintain the property during the term of the contract. If you agree to sell, you will sell. So this is, you know, if we find a buyer to this and the buyer comes in and they're, you know, they write a contract, you have to follow through. In the event that the home was built prior to 1978, we will have additional documents to fill out. I'll put that on there too. Lead based change. Um, if you and I, the broker, or the agent and the seller, or the broker and the seller have any disputes, we agree to go through mediation before we start suing each other. We will not discriminate. This does need to be updated. Basically, we don't discriminate. classes, um, fair housing laws. We can't use where we'd actually scan paper through a big machine and send it and print out. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> so enforcement, this is an enforceable contract. And if you sign a contract, you know you, you, it will be an enforceable contract as well. We are not um, authorized to give out any information on sexual offenders or criminal activity in an area that any buyers or sellers, if they have any curiosity on it, would need to go look that up themselves. Is a disclosure that the seller can irrevocably conveys any and all the seller's audio, photography, and video rights in perpetuity involving the seller and seller's family, seller's property for the broker for marketing and advertising. The reason this sounds so big and scary is just what I said earlier. Once you put this on the MLS and it syndicates, you cannot put the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, it just happens. So it is going to be out there for a while. Surveillance, basically a seller agrees to abide by any laws uh, in regulating audio and video sur surveillance. They have to apply by South Carolina laws, they then can authorize to whether or not you disclose the potential surveillance. Should they push back on this, you just need to understand, explain to them that most buyers, if they're represented by an agent, have signed a document that has said there is a chance that the home will be surveilled because your buyer's agency agreement basically says that. 
Other uh, terms or conditions, this would be where you put something in as far as variable rate can, um, commission in the event you took a listing and they were for sale by owner for a while and they you know, had two buyers that were hot prospects and you agreed to take a discounted or no commission on those two buyers, you would put those things in the other terms and conditions. This big, bold, scary paragraph says that you understand the warrant that they own the property and have the authority to execute this agreement. It's a legally binding agreement. And if you um, have any questions about it, you search uh, further assistance if the contents are not understood. You acknowledge the receipt of a copy of this agreement, or excuse me, a copy of the agency relationship uh, disclosure, and they agree to receive communications from the broker at the email address provided below, which is where they would put their email address, just again, consenting to hearing from you. All right. Listings in a nutshell. What questions do you have? I was away for a couple of minutes. Um, that the very beginning part regarding the times. Mm -hmm. um, I know you said there's a seven day uh, window um, after signing the listing agreement before you're required to put it on MLS. Correct. Did I understand correctly? that after that seven days, you can put it as a coming soon listing, which gets you another additional seven days before you're required to put it on MLS. So you have, you could really have a 14 day window before you're required to put it on MLS. Yeah, kind of right. Um, you have a 14 day window before you need to allow showings. You have seven okay. days to put it in the MLS, the MLS status that, it, the coming soon status is an MLS status. Okay. So you're technically putting it in the MLS at that point for everyone to see it. You can withhold showings and for seven days at that point. Okay. Now, the other rule that came out, the third part of these rules um, that came out was in the event you, let's say you put, let's say you do all that compliance and then a few days later, a couple weeks later, they decide to take it off. You know, they want to withhold showings. <clears throat> at that point, if they're going to withhold showings for longer than seven days, they would have to move it to it. They'd have to move it to temporarily off the market. Right. They couldn't leave it in there as active with no showings for more than seven days. Okay. Cool. All right. Anything else? Well, cool. Well, there we go. Contracts and or listings in 53 minutes.